Hey guys, it's Sam. Welcome back to my channel. I hope you guys are having an amazing day. For today's video, as you guys can see by the title down there, today we're talking about Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker. Now, please trigger warning, this is a very gruesome case. I know that I've been saying that a lot, but I'm sorry. It's just, it is a very heavy case. Um, and so I do want to let you know that there will be details that, you know, they they will make you uncomfortable. So um, if you don't want to feel that or don't want to learn about this case, totally I understand. Just click out of this video and I'll see you guys on my next one. Before we get started, please don't forget to subscribe and little button down there. And if you want to know more about Richard Ramirez and the horrible crimes and murders that he committed, then just keep on watching. So Richard Ramirez was born in El Paso, Texas. To the name Ricardo Leva Muñoz Ramirez. On February 29th, 1960, he was the youngest of five siblings and his parents were named Julian and Mercedes Ramirez. His father was of Mexican nationality and he was a cop in Ciudad Juarez. Richard's dad, Julian, was prone to just bursts of anger, which unfortunately often resulted in physical abuse to his children and I'm sure his wife. As a 12 year old, Richard or Richie, like his family would call him, he was strongly influenced by his cousin, his older cousin named Miguel. Richard had begun smoking marijuana at the age of 10. And him and Miguel would bond over this. Miguel would often tell Richard stories about everything that would went down when he was in the military and he was um, doing during the Vietnam War. These stories were very gruesome as well as very gory. Miguel would also go ahead and teach Richard some military skills, such as killing with stealth, which means killing with one hit of an eligible weapon like a gun i'm pretty sure like a knife and miguel would go and tell richie about how when he was in the military miguel was in the military they actually tortured and mutilated the woman and he actually had pictures of the things that they did to these vietnamese women and he actually like would show richard the pictures to seek a little bit of escape from Richard's dad's kind of like temper. Richard would often go to a local cemetery and just sleep there. After developing epilepsy as a kid, Richard got into drinking as well as using heavy drugs. And this is when he started being interested in Satanism. On May 4th, 1973, Richard was actually present when his cousin Miguel shot and killed his wife. Miguel shot his wife with a caliber .38 gun right on the face and this happened during a just a domestic argument so they were just like fighting and I'm guessing the cousin just got tired of the fight and he decided to shoot his wife. After the shooting Richard began to withdraw himself from his family and later on, he would move in with his older sister, Ruth. Unfortunately, Ruth's husband, he was actually a obsessive peeping Tom, meaning that he would just try and peek um, in somebody's like window to see them either change or even in the rest, like in the bathroom when somebody would be taking a shower. And at this point, he would also take Richard um, on his like noctur nocturnal exploits. Around that time, Richard began using LSD and he cultivated an even bigger uh, interest in Satanism. In regards to Richard's cousin, Mike, he was actually found not guilty in 1977 for the murder of his wife um, with the plea of insanity. So he actually went to the Texas State Mental Hospital and he was incarcerated there for four years. So Richard started melding his fantasies, his sexual fantasies, with violence as well as forced bondage. When he was in high school, he took a job at a hotel 
um, the local Holiday Inn. He would actually use his um, hotel key to go into the guest rooms and rob from them. His employment actually ended abruptly because he actually attempted rape with one of the guests. Although the husband got right on time before Richard could do anything, um, the husband actually did beat Richard. The charges against Richard actually were dropped uh, because a couple was from out of state and they didn't want to come back uh, from where they lived to just come and testify. So the charges were dropped. Richard dropped from uh, Jefferson High School when he was in the ninth grade. At the age of 22, he moved to California and that's where he settled permanently. In 1981 and in 1982, he was actually arrested in LA for auto theft. And this is where he noticeably started to neglect his personal hygiene. His crimes quickly escalated into murders and with his first known murder in June 28th 1984 for his first murder Richard attacked a 79 year old woman in her home as a burglary everything started with him just trying to rob her but he actually sexually assaulted her and then stabbed her to death now, this is where we're gonna get into kind of like um, his murders and his crimes um, some of them are pretty gruesome, so just trigger warning here. Nine months after, um, Richard struck again on March 17, 19, 1985. This time around, he attacked a woman that fortunately was able to get away from him. But he then killed her roommate, a 34-year-old woman. Not being satisfied with the assaults, so not satisfied with those assaults, Richard went about a mile away from the from where he had killed a 30-year-old roommate and he attacked a 30-year-old woman on the same evening. Now just 10 days later, on March 27th, Richard murdered a 64-year-old man and his 44 year old wife and he used an attack that would eventually become his signature and mo during his murders and when he came in through the restroom window he stole um things that would accumulate to about forty thousand dollars he shot the husband first and then he went to sexually abuse the wife and stabbed her to death from what I read from the other cases, this was the only time where Richard actually gouged her eyes and then took took the eyes with him. Um, there's nothing compared to this one in any other case, which I found very odd. In February of 1985, Richard climbed into a window of a six-year-old that was sleeping and he took her from her bed. The girl recalls uh, being woken up by the sound of the window opening. In her sleepy state, she recalls that she uh, saw Richard and it reminded her of a um, family member. So that's why she just went with him and he carried her out of the house through her window. Richard actually made the little girl open the glove compartment to show her that there was a gun there and he said just so you know that's there once they got to that designated place he made the little girl get into a duffel bag and that's the way that he carried the girl inside and into his room and the girl remembers that there was it was like a house and it was like a fenced house and there were a lot of german shepherds and she could hear them like bark Ramirez then proceeded to sexually abuse the girl all through the night. After what seemed hours of torture, Richard actually took the little girl into the duffel bag and then into his car and he drove her um, to a place that was near a gas station and he told her to go to the gas station 
and to call 911 so that they could contact her family and they would uh, be able to go and pick her up. On May 14th, 1985, Richard took the lives of 66 year old man and raped and robbed his wife. The detectives actually say that um, his wife actually, you know, survived the attack because before the husband died, he was actually able to call 911 and, you know, police and paramedics were able to get to their home. Um, and so the wife was able to survive the attack. At this moment, there were no suspects uh, to any of these murders. They could not put two and two together. They had no clue or evidence um, that would tie these murders together. So on May 29th, Richard killed an 83-year-old woman. He taped her with electrical tape and she sexually assaulted her and beaten her to death with a hammer. In this case, the victim lived with her sister that was disabled. Richard actually attacked the other um, sister, uh, but she, was, she actually survived the attack. In this specific case, Richard, detectives say that Richard got very um, comfortable in this crime scene because he went into the kitchen and he actually had the time to make himself a snack. Also, this was the first time that they saw a pantogram and it was actually written on the victim's leg with a lipstick. On June 28th, he took another life. And this was a 32-year-old woman and he cut her throat as well as stabbed her to death. Now, just a few miles from the last murder, Richard took the life of a 75-year-old woman and similar to the last murder, he slit her throat to kill her. Now, three days later, on July 5th, not too far away from the last two murders, Richard attacked a 16-year-old girl that was in her bedroom in her parents' house and he beat her with a tire iron. Fortunately, she did survive the attack. She ended up with 42 lacerations and some skull fractures. At this time, we learned that in the past seven murders, there was a footprint of a shoe. And this is where the police kind of started um, putting things together. That was the only clue that they had. And so they work off of that shoe print trying to figure out, obviously, the brand and the sizing of the shoe. Now, on July 7th, Richard attacked a 60-year-old woman in her home. Now, in this murder, um, her family, her son and the wife and the granddaughter actually found her body in her house. She was brutally beaten to death and Richard had also sexually abused her. From the autopsy, uh, they could see that she actually did fight Richard because she like one of her nails were broken and there was evidence that she did put up a fight with Richard. In less than a mile away from that murder, Richard attacked another woman and he raped her. There was one night where a police officer um, stopped a car that he had just um, done a traffic violation and he stopped the car and when he asked the when the police man asked the man to step out of the car and to put his hands on the on the hood, um, he actually made a comment like, oh, you're not that guy that's killing people, right? And that, obviously, it was Richard. So it set him off and he drew a pentagram while the policeman was walking back to the car to get the citation um, book and he, like, just ran off. So... They could have caught him right then and then, but he got away. Now, at the crime scene of the uh, elderly woman that had the lipstick pentagram on her life, now, they sent off, that was a clue, so they sent off this car to get handprints, but unfortunately, they never got around to getting the handprints off of the car. The detectives actually decided to go ahead and search the car, and in the car they found a card, a business card for a dentist that was located in Chinatown. Now, when they went to interview the, the dentist, so the dentist was able to give them some um, x-rays of Richard's teeth. And so the police were planning on sticking out because, you know, the dentist explained that he had a tooth that was 
eventually gonna kill him so he had to like be back at the dentist and so they decided to stake out the um, dental office and they put some policemen there but unfortunately the police captain um, he said that it was just a waste of money that he was not gonna come back and he decided to pull them in out of the um, dental office detective Gill um, he said you know what like we need to figure out a way to see if he actually comes back and so they decided to put um, some robbery alarm buttons in the office so in the case that Richard would be back they would be able to trigger those those alarms and you know police would get there and then they would eventually capture Richard now on July 15th the dentist actually called Detective Gill and he asked why didn't they go and that he had called them several times through the alarm but the alarm had mal malfunctioned and the dentist said that Richard had gone in that day now on July 20th Richard actually attacked an older couple in their home the husband was about 60 years old and the wife was 66 Richard shot both of them and he of course um, sexually assaulted the wife now that same night Richard actually attacked another family and we can see a trend that he was just not caring anymore. He was actually doing two crimes in a night. He, in this crime, he executed the husband and then proceeded to sexually abuse the wife as well as their eight-year-old son. This location, they, the police figured that he was there for about three hours. And although the wife, you know, was traumatized of what had happened, she was actually uh, able to give the police a pretty good uh, description to what Richard looked like. And this was eventually going to be the description that um, the police were going to go public with. Now on August 6th, there was another murder. Now this time, Richard went into the house and he shot the, the woman right in her nostril. And then he went to attack the husband and he shot him. On the head but because it didn't go through or I don't even I can't even imagine like he shot him in the head but the husband was actually able to chase down Richard out of the house this murder Richard um, for the past murders Richard had been using a 22 caliber gun but for this one he actually used a 25 auto instead now Richard did attack another 35 year old woman um, as well as sexually assaulted her. To this, the victim did say that he, because she did survive, that Richard told him to not look at him. And she said, I swear to God, I won't look at you. And then he said, don't swear to God, swear to Satan. And she proceeded to say, I swear to Satan. So at this point, um, the LA, LAPD decided to make a video where they would just um they would be able to show it on tv and it would be just like a warning for the public um and with the information that they had at that point so with the relentless media as well as the pressure from the police um richard eventually left la and he went north to san francisco this 18th richard attacked another family and he killed the husband with a bullet on his head as well as sexually assault the wife and then uh, proceeded to shot her in the head when police got there uh, she still had a pulse and so she was taken to the San Francisco hospital now at this particular scene uh, Richard again got too comfortable and he actually ate all the food that was in the refrigerator and then he proceeded to vomit in the kitchen floor as well as masturbated in the living room. This is another time where police found a, a pentagram on the wall. Now in San Francisco, they actually had no idea that this was the same killer from LA. And so the, Glen the Glendale 
police department reached out to uh, the uh, San Francisco police and suggested to run a ballistics report uh, from the victim's body because they wanted to see if it was um, the same type of gun that was used in the LA crimes up in San Francisco. And so after doing the ballistics report, the San Francisco Police Department got the same results that the Glendale Police had. Now in LA, they had actually given him the name of the Valley Intruder. And based off of Richard's unmistakable MO, completed with satanic rituals, press actually quickly um, gave him another name, which was the Night Stalker. And because most of his assaults will take place at night. The next murder, I couldn't find exact date, but around 3 a.m., a 29-year-old a woman told police that an intruder had gone into their house and he had attacked her boyfriend and he shot him. And then when he turned to her, Richard sexually assaulted her. He actually referred to himself as the Night Stalker. Now, in this murder, they were sure that Richard had come back from San Francisco to the LA area. Now, during that attack, Richard was not you know, didn't see anybody outside. And there was this one kid that was uh, working on a bike, you know, in his home. And he actually saw the car and um, he actually was able to give a partial plate number to the police. Now, this information did get released to the public. And a person called the police and said that their friend had actually just had gotten his um, car stolen near Chinatown and that this plate on the stolen car matched with the plate that the witness had seen. They did find the car abandoned and they were able to take uh, prints off of that car from the rear mi mirror. When they found the car abandoned, they were actually able to pull off a fingerprint from the rear mi mirror and unfortunately they the fingerprints back then were not automated so they weren't like in a computer system um so they actually had to uh go from they actually had to take that fingerprint and get an expert to go ahead and just match that fingerprint they had on fingerprint cards that they had um about you know people that have gotten that had a record on august 27 Police got a call from a woman saying that her father had a friend named Rick and that her father actually thought that he was the Night Stalker killer. Now a team got sent to their house so that they can um, interview the dad. The dad, they interviewed the dad and the dad said that um, his friend Rick was from El Paso, Texas but he didn't have a last name to go with that name. Now, one of the key things that the dad had mentioned to the police was that Rick had actually mentioned to him um, a murder that he had committed in Monterey Park. He did kill a couple in Monterey Park and that he had said that they were an Asian couple and that he had killed them with a 22 caliber weapon. Now, Richard give, gave this gun to the dad um, and the dad actually took it to someone in Tijuana, which is right across the border from uh, where I live. And um, and so the detectives were able to take the dad down to Tijuana and find whoever he had got like given the thing the gun to. And he they actually had like this big box, big radio. They were able to trace back this radio to another murder, another murder that had happened, and they were able to link those two murders together. Now, at this time, it was sure that, you know, Rick was the Night Stalker and they just had to find a way to um, get him. Now, back in San Francisco, there was a police informant by the name of Earl Gregg that brought in a bracelet that he thought might be linked to the Night Stalker. He says that he got the bracelet from his wife's mother and then when they went to interview the mom, which she lived in San Pablo, California, uh, she told the police that he had gotten that bracelet from her boyfriend, Armando Rodriguez. And that the boyfriend, Armando, had gotten that bracelet from a friend that was from El Paso, Texas. 
So, I mean, at this point, literally, they were just like, the pieces of the puzzle were just putting themselves together. And they just had like, they just had to find that breaking point where they could like, get him. She did tell the police that Rick would, would always wear an ACDC um, hat in that he had rotten, bath, bad teeth. This is where police start getting close and closer to Richard. When police approached Armando and, you know, they asked him that they were looking into a series of murders and that if, you know, he could help them, he straight up said no, that he was not going to help them. And then police, you know, asked him, you know, if you know a, a person named Rick, and he said, he's not, he's not the Night Stalker. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, I'm not going to help you. Now, you know, police were, at this point, they were fed up with everything. Um, literally, Richard was like slipping through their fingers and they could not just, they couldn't catch him. And so police um, took Armando into the car, in the back seat. And Detective Falson, which is his name, um, the one that was in charge in san francisco um he you know started beating him and armando you know got to a point he was like okay okay it's richard ramirez and he like went like this and he was like richard ramirez richard ramirez so that they could you know stop beating him um and so they got the name they finally got the name and uh, now it was just time to actually get him now on august 30th um lapd got the name and so they were informed and they compared the fingerprint that they had to the eight Richard Ramirez's that they had in fi like on file. They took the pictures to the informant and they were able to, or he was able to pick, you know, the Richard Ramirez. So now they had a picture. Now they knew how, he, like how he looked like, who he was. Now with uh, the media and just everybody, you know, tired of these murders, they wanted to catch you know, Richard, um, the the detectives in LAPD, they wanted to get a chance at him and try to find him. Um, but, you know, the overall, like, police department, they decided that they were going to actually disclose to the media and disclose his name as long as with the picture. And that went on a national te television. They went, they got printed uh, newspapers. By August 31st, there was a chase of trying to find him. And, you know, they were on newspapers. And so, um, in the actual Netflix documentary, they mentioned how Richard had left, actually, um, San Francisco or L.A. Because he was out in L.A. already. And he had gotten to Arizona. So, they found out that he had left Arizona. And um, when Richard got back to L.A. through the um, through a bus, he actually, uh, he got to the station and he noticed that they were, he was able to point, like, to point out, like, the police that they were there, um, and they explained, you know, how most often, you know, policemen undercover would dress up as homeless, uh, but they would have, like, clean teeth or, like, clean hair, and so it was, it was very apparent that they were not homeless people, and so, um, Richard started to panic, he got into a bus and he started, like, um, going to where he had a brother um where he were that lived in la so he was on the bus and he was going there and this is where um you know people actually like looked at him i'm putting like glue on my lash they looked at him and they recognized him from the picture on the newspaper so he got off and he started like running like in between the streets and at this point, there were already, um, you know, people calling and saying that they had seen him. And he got to East LA. And this is where a community of people um, actually, like, got him and started beating him. And, you know, it was the picture on the newspaper, so they knew that it was him. Now, this cop, he heard on the on their, like, the police radio, you know, that they were, there was this one fight. And so, he got to the scene and he arrested him. And so, I mean, if it wasn't for those people that they took it into their own, they were, the community was just so exhausted of, like, everything that had gone on for a year that they were, they were just, they did... They just didn't care and they just went for it and like, you know, they were beating him. And so he got arrested. 
he was so beaten that the paramedics had to put like a turban on his head because he was bleeding from his arms like he had like scratches so um they had to do that and then they took him into custody so at this point richard obviously was not talking he wasn't obviously confessing to the murders or anything um but the detectives actually told him that they were going to put him in the same jail cell that um the hillside strangler um, actually stayed in the state prison and richard was excited um and detectives you know they knew that he was interested in serial killings and serial killers and so they made him feel important in hoping in hope that he would speak up and just say you know the atrocious murders that he had done now if you remember there was a the six-year-old that Richard had taken from her wind like from her house through the windows well they brought her in for the lineup and she was able to identify Richard from the lineup now on October October 24th same year 1985 he was actually accused of 14 victims and that's the day that he showed the pentagram that he had on his palm and I'll put a picture here um, and he yelled hail Satan so during his time in jail before like his actual trial he would actually get a bunch of fan mail and it isn't said that he had a lot of groupies uh, like sending him like nude pictures of or them like in you know weird poses and stuff and people say that you know there was just this like animalistic like sexual attraction that people had towards him like if you actually see pictures of him like he I personally don't think he's attractive at all also like knowing everything that he done of course not but like I'm saying like him like his physical features like how did people like find him attractive apart from like his rotten teeth and stuff like it said that he smelled horrible that he had no personal like hygiene whatsoever so like how i just don't understand how people were attracted to that now on september 20th 1989 richard was found guilty of all 43 counts now, when Detective Felsen was taking him into custody to the San Quintin um, State Prison, Richard actually asked the detective if he wanted to know about a murder that had happened in somewhere in San Francisco. And Richard just said, it was me. So, you know, with that, obviously, detectives looking at or all the murder evidence and the scenes you know it's apparent that that year that he killed people and he got caught it wasn't his first time killing um unfortunately they're aware that they may they may be cases out there um you know of people that he actually murdered but they were never linked to the recent you know 19 1985 murders now, Richard was taken to the San Quintin State Prison and he stayed there wearing, waiting for his death road for about 20 years. Um, but he actually did pass away on June 7th, uh, 2013 and he died of cancer. I mean, if you think about it, 20 years in prison was nothing uh, compared to all the, um, you know, horrible murders that he committed and his crimes and, you know, um, then they realized that there were many um, assaults that were to little children like from ages like 6 to 10 and um, somehow they were linked to him uh, because of how similar all, all of them were. And so if you think about like all the pain that he um, put families through and even the detectives like the you could see the pain if you watch the night stalker on netflix which i definitely recommend um you can see when the detectives were just talking about the case and mind you like this was like 30 years ago and you could still see the pain in his eyes um and it's just i, I literally get goosebumps because i i can't imagine you know living in a time where you know serial killers although we love true crime and we love reading about it can't imagine living in a time where you know there's a serial killer and you know you're just terrorized by that and not knowing who it is if the person could come into your home and just you know 
kill you. So um, it was a very heavy um, topic. I researched and I also watched the Night Stalker, um, like I said, on Netflix. I totally recommend. It is pretty heavy. Um, I was actually really, really surprised by the amount of the crime scenes. I'm sorry, it's not funny. It's just that I can't, I couldn't wrap my head around that, that they showed um, the crime scenes and pictures of, you know, the murders that he had done. And some of them were pretty gruesome. So um, definitely, you know, like have that in mind that it is, you know, it, you, it will give you a, I, I even got scared while watching it. It was just, it was a little bit too much to watch all in one go. Um, but yeah, it's four episodes long, about 45 minutes each. So it's a good documentary. You do get to, you know, see the side of the detectives and how they felt during um, this investigation. So that is it for today's video. I hope you guys enjoyed and, you know, learned something. Uh, please obviously stay safe. Um, you know, we never know what's going on out there because I feel like the news um, don't really let us know um, of other things that are going out, you know, in the outside world. And so sometimes we are in this like little bubble of ours just living our lives, but we need to make sure that we are also taking care of ourselves and paying attention when you're walking to your car, when you're leaving your house, um, you know, when you're coming back um, to your house, you know, you never know. So please stay safe. All the products that I did use in the, today's video will be linked down in the description box as well as all my social media. And until then, I'll see you guys on my next one. Bye.